right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Couch Warrior Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today we're going to be breaking down the first week of Dana White's Contender Series. We're still, I believe, two weeks out, so we're doing this a little bit early, but that's what I like to do when Dana White's Contender Series comes around. I feel like it's good to get ahead of the lines early. The lines are already out, so we're, we're going to be able to talk about them. I'll tell you guys what I'm looking out for, what I've already played. And we'll try to break this down pretty quick. I don't want this video to be longer than like 25 minutes. So let's see what we can do. We're going to hop right in. I'm really excited for this Dana White's Contender Series uh, ser uh, season. A lot of really dope fighters are signed up already, and it should be a really good one. So we're going to hop right into it. And this first fight here, we've got Kevin Borges versus Victor Diaz. Kevin is 8-1-0. And we don't have much on his measurables or anything like that. He trains out of Pitbull Martial Arts. That much we know. Victor Diaz on the other side. He's at American Top Team. He's actually training with Pantoja. He's got a bunch of pictures with him. And it makes sense once you consider his style. Uh, Diaz, he is a... Oh, let me talk about his thing real quick. He's 32, five foot six. I think he's going to be about the same height, maybe a little bit shorter than Borja's, just off of my eye, eye, uh, eye test. But for this fight, look, Diaz is a black belt. He's, I believe, a second degree black belt training with Pantoja. His grappling is very, very good. He's shown in, in multiple fights at this point, pretty much all of them, that he has very good wrestling and he's got a really, really good submission grappling game. He's submitted some really good guys. He's got some good wins. He's got a win over Rezobek Ibrahimov, who, you know, his record's not pretty, but he's fighting tough guys and he's a good fighter himself. And I thought that was a good win. So I think that grappling is what's going to get the job done here. You look at Kevin and he's a great striker. He's a great striker, but most of this, most of the. I find uh, one of his recent fights, the 2022 one uh, Inca FC 34. And he won that one. I believe it was a knockout. I think all of, all of his wins are by knockout. He's never been to decision. He's been submitted once, never been knocked out himself. He's got great striking, nice combinations, fast hands. I like a lot that I'm seeing from him, but I just don't know how he's going to be able to survive this ground game. We've only really seen him tested on the ground one time. It was against Renzo Mendez, who actually has a loss to someone fighting later that we're going to talk about. And in that fight, he he seemed to have been winning, but he got dropped in the fourth, I think it was. And then he got submitted with a rear naked. And if Diaz gets him on the ground, I have to think that his jujitsu is just going to be too much for him now. A few more things to consider. Uh, Kevin, he was supposed to actually fight two different people already. Both of them fell out. One of them, I'm blanking on the name. He's the guy who went on to fight Zalgas actually recently and beat him. And then the other fella, he dropped out. I don't know why. So this is his third scheduled opponent for this card. He's had to really uh, kind of just change his game plan already three times, depending on who he's fighting. And Victor Diaz, he's a very difficult opponent to prepare for on short notice. Now, Diaz, he's also coming in on short notice. That's something to consider. He last fought at 135. This is at flyweight. He Most of his career was at flyweight, so I don't expect him to have too much trouble getting down there. He's not really a huge flyweight by any means, but in a striker versus grappler matchup where I think Kevin is a good striker, but not elite by any means, and I think that Diaz is a really, really good jujitsu practitioner and a great wrestler, I have to think that Diaz is going to get him out of there at some point. He's a minus 400 favorite at the moment. That's not playable. I don't have any interest on the un underdog either, though. What I will be looking out for once props drop is I'll be looking for the sub for Victor Diaz, and I'll be looking for the unders if those are playable. I have a feeling neither prop might be playable, but we'll have to wait and see. But for me, it's going to be Victor Diaz here. I do think he's going to get that dub. Next up, we've got a great fight. We've got Peyton Talbot versus Reyes Cortez. Cortez, he's actually the brother of um, Tracy Cortez. He trains out of fight ready as well. He has already fought on the contender series last season, I believe it was, or maybe the one before that. He fought against Christian Rodriguez. He lost that fight, but honestly, he showed some good things. And Christian Rodriguez, we have seen already. He's a very, very good fighter, great martial artist, got a great career ahead of him. And while Cortez definitely lost, he showed some great things. I liked the striking in that fight. I liked the body work in particular. I noticed that. And he was able to take C-Rod down, was able to control him a decent amount. The numbers say five minutes. I don't know about all that. Maybe a lot of that was fence control time. 
but he was able to get those takedowns. And in the regional since then, so the most recent fight, it was the Smith fight. For some reason, he chose not to wrestle at all. He didn't even shoot a takedown. I don't know why, but I think it was just because he felt comfortable on the feet. His striking has improved. I've always considered him kind of a meat and potato striker, but I would say that he's kind of leaving that. He's becoming a much better striker. He's got good combinations. He's got good counters. I actually really like what I'm seeing. He's mixing it up really well. And like I mentioned, those body shots are fantastic. And his wrestling is good when he chooses to use it. Nice takedowns, nice trips. He knows what to do. He got a great snap down takedown in one of his recent fights. It was really slick. Pulled the guy down right towards his back. Sorry about that. And I just think that the grappling is going to be really important here. Now you look at Peyton Talbot, right? And he seems to be relatively green. His career, I believe his pro career started in 2020, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even 2021. Three of his uh, five fights, is it five? Yeah, three of his five fights have been in uh, A1 Combat, Uriah Faber's league. And you know what I actually noticed? I noticed on the side of the octagon the name Talbot, which is his last name. And it was Talbot Plastic Surgery. I looked it up. It appears that that's his father or some kind of family figure. And they're related and they sponsor that, that promotion. Does it really mean anything? No, but it, it might explain some of these favorable matchups he's been given because he's a really nice striker. I actually was pleasantly surprised. I didn't recognize him by name. And when I turned on the tape, I was like, all right, he's pretty good. Fast hands, good combinations, and he's very accurate, which I noticed. And I think that's really important. He mixes it up well. And I think that at range, it's going to be a close fight. I think that at range, Peyton will probably land the better shots. But once Cortez gets a little bit closer, gets closer into that pocket, I think he's going to be the one landing more significant strikes, especially if he goes to the body. Now, what it's going to come down to is if he wrestles. Because Talbot, his takedown defense isn't quite there. His get-up game is pretty good. He scrambles. He does his damn best to get back up. He's definitely not going to just sit there and let Cortez sit on top of him. He's going to make his life difficult. He's going to try to get back up. But I think that there's a clear path here for Cortez because the gap on the striking is not that wide, in my opinion. And I think in terms of grappling, it's fairly wide because you don't see Talbot wrestle. And his takedown defense isn't great. And he's not getting submissions. It's not something he really looks for. He has tried them. I think it was an arm bar I saw him go for. But in general, he's just his ground game is very lacking. And as someone who's 5-0, and who started his career relatively recently, it makes sense. He's still green, right? He still has to put it together. And because of that, I like Cortez here quite a bit. I thought that I wouldn't because I remembered Cortez being not that like amazing in the in the sea rod fight. But once I ran back that fight and I ran back his more recent ones, I'm seeing improvements. I'm seeing things I like. And he just has that wrestling edge that I think he's going to use or really should use. And if he does, I think he's going to win this fight fairly comfortably he's an underdog already he's plus 110 i think he opened up as the favorite but right now money is still coming in on talbot so i'm gonna wait i'm gonna sit and wait i'm gonna see what happens with the line and at some point i'm gonna make my move and i am gonna put a unit on cortez because i really do think he should be the favorite as it opened i think that was the correct line and the more the more he becomes a dog the more i'm gonna get interested and i i am gonna get to a play for him so for me, in this fight, it's Cortez, although I think it's going to be a really fun fight, and Talbot is definitely someone to look forward to in the future. We'll move on, though, to our next fight, the third one on the card. We've got Cal Machado versus Kevin Soflarski. This is a heavyweight bout. Man, I spent two hours jumping into the rabbit hole of finding Soflarski's freaking tape because on tape index and whatnot, you've only got like 2020, 2019, and older uh, fights. And he has had more recent ones, right? One of them was Poland Regionals, and the other one was this other Polish promotion that I don't really know. Forgot what it was called. Babylon. Babylon is what it's called. So I did some Googling. I did some Google translating. Eventually, I was able to find little clips, at least, of, of his fights. And, you know, this this, this fight, it, it's, a, it's a shit show. We've got Kyle Machado. He's 7-1-1, one, one, 29 years old, 6'4". Let me double check his camp. His camp is Franco Martin MMA. He's training out in Canada. That's where he's fighting out of. And most of his fights have been in BFL, the league over there in Canada, which to be completely honest, is a pretty low caliber league. I mean, 
I'll talk about his opponents in a sec. We're talking pretty damn low caliber. <clears throat> Excuse me. And on the other side, Saflarski, 11, 1, and 0, 28 years old. He's one year younger. He's going to be two inches taller at six foot six. He's going to have an 81 and a half inch reach. In terms of his camp, I don't have anything. So we're going to go with Academia, Sportau, Walki, Willa now. So what all I got, right? So look. Both guys are coming off of wins over 44 and 45 year old men. So Flarsky's last opponent was 45 and Machado's last opponent was 44. The fight before that for Machado, he fought, uh, what's his name? Main Lee, I believe Lee main Lee main is 56 years old. When they fought, he was 55. I believe 55. <laughs> they got this guy out here fighting a 55 year old man, you know? So, it's pretty rough. Like his best win in that scene, in my opinion, is Chris Larson, who's this big, like refrigerator of a man. Let me turn off my sound. Sorry, guys. Phone is popping off. And that was a decent win, but he didn't really do much. He kind of just landed a good shot against the fence and put him down. I think the best way to tackle this fight is to not tackle it at all. I think that it's a really low level heavyweight fight where neither guy has really fought anyone that good and neither guy really seems to stand out anywhere. But I tend like I, as a pick, I'm going to lean Saflarski. I think that in terms of striking, I haven't seen much striking from Machado, but I think I like Saflarski's a little bit better. I really like his jab. I noticed the jab and I actually really like it. He works well with that jab. And then the combinations that follow are pretty good. He's throwing some oblique kicks. Don't really see that often in heavyweight unless you're like Cyril gone. So that was pretty cool. But he's also very hittable. He was getting pieced up in the Stawowi fight. His takedown defense looks good, but we're talking bad competition. And you can say the same thing with Machado. His takedown defense has looked good, but against low-level competition. And I will say Saflarski does have good grappling. I like his trips. I like the takedowns, and he's very heavy on top. He's got five submission wins. He's got a pretty good back take for a guy of his size. You know, it seems... <laughs> it would be kind of hard to hop on there and take the back real quick. And he, he he can do it. So I just feel that he's a little bit better in each aspect than Machado is. I like his submission game better than Machado. And I like his striking better than Machado. Although I could be wrong on either of those. I do think the takedowns also are going to go to Soflarski, the wrestling edge. But again, this is a very hard fight to cap. And I really wouldn't put my money on it. I'm going to see what ha ends up happening with the odds. Right now, Soflarski is a plus 100 underdog. I do think he wins, so I'm I'm getting a little bit tempted, but I'm going to need a better price than that because, like I said, both guys are low level. We don't have a ton of information. We're working with low-level competition. It's hard to get to figure out how, just how good they are. So I'm going to pick Kevin Soflarski here. I'm going to pick him to win by – I can't even tell you, man. It could be anything. It could be a – could be a decision, maybe a knockout. I don't really see a knockout. I don't know. This fight is going to be a mess. I'm going to go with Saflarski as the pick. No method that I'm going to give out, and we're going to move on to our next fight. All right, next up, we've got Tom Nolan versus Bogdan Grodd. Nolan is 5-0 and oh undefeated. He's 23 years old, six foot three with a 76-inch reach, training out of Team Compton Training Center over in Australia. He did spend, I think, a week or so over an Extreme Couture, so that's good. But at the end of the day, that's not where he trains. On the other side, Grodd, he's 11, 1, and 1. Oh, he's 5 foot 9, so he's going to be 6 inches shorter here, guys. Definitely going to have it reach this advantage. Training out of ETTL Bros MMA, that is what I saw on Instagram as well. And look, Nolan is one of these guys who is really, really big for the division, right? For lightweight, he's a very large man, 6 foot 3. We're talking about guys like Jalen Turner. We're talking about guys like Euros Medic before he just left and went up to welterweight. And another one that comes to mind is Sam Patterson, right? And what happened with Sam Patterson? Sam Patterson got knocked the hell out by Yanal Ashmos. So in terms of this fight, Tom Nolan, he's fighting competition that I don't really love. Look, neither guy is, but from my experience so far capping and capping guys from Australia and capping contender series guys from Australia in particular is that it's not a great regional scene. It really isn't. We're not getting a lot of good guys out of there. We did get Steve Ersig out of there. We did get uh, Brandon Jenkins out of there. Two very solid guys. 
And I think Jack Della Maddalena fought there too, but don't quote me on that one. And in general, I just feel like the competition isn't great. And Tom Nolan, he's young. He's 23, right? So he's going to be rapidly, rapidly improving. And the skill, the talent is definitely there. The talent is there and the skill will develop. The striking looked pretty good to me. I really like the combinations. I like the work he does. He's very, very aggressive. But because of that, it seems that he gets a little bit sloppy. He can be very hittable at times. He'll over miss and just leave himself open for counters. And while he does have enough power to maybe put out someone like Rod, I'm not really seeing that happening here. At range, he's pretty good, but he doesn't really stay at range. He kind of just crashes the pocket, runs at his opponent, and tries just straight going for it, trying to get that knockout. He doesn't really wrestle. The one or two times I saw him do it, it was okay, but he doesn't really do too much with it. He doesn't have any submission wins or anything like that. And the big thing that stood out to me is that he, his takedown defense, it, it's not good. Not right now, not yet. It's not great. In the Adam Cook fight, Adam Cook is it did not look very good to me. And Adam Cook was taking him down. Adam Cook, I'm pretty sure, took his back, if I'm not mistaken. And just took him down too much for my liking. And Adam Cook is no good. Eventually, he finished Adam Cook, but it, was, it wasn't a good look for me. And that's exactly what I was looking for. It's funny, though, because both guys are uh, BJJ brown belts. Although I'm really not seeing that out of Nolan. At least grad, he has two submission wins. And you can actually see that jujitsu at work. I'll talk about him in a second. But... I'm just not seeing it so much with Nolan in terms of the grappling. I think his upside is in the striking, and the cleaner he gets, the more he develops, the less crazy he gets with the striking, the better he's going to be. And I actually think that he might be one of the better prospects coming out of Australia. I just think that he's not going to win this one. So on the other side with Bogdan Grad, keep getting mixed up with his name. It's such a funky last name, Grad. I really like his striking, right? He's a short and stocky guy. He hasn't really fought anyone this size, so that's a question mark. But from what I've seen, when he fights taller opponents, he is able to close the distance. He is able to do his work. I really like what I see in terms of the striking. He's very fast, good hands. He'll go to the body. He'll mix it up well. I think he's just t tighter and cleaner in the striking than Nolan is. He's got seven knockout wins of his own to Nolan's three. He does have more fights, though, so to be fair. But his wrestling is very solid. I actually really like the wrestling. I think he's going to have a clear, clear, clear grappling edge here. And the jujitsu is good. Like, I, I like his ground game. I like the back takes. And when he's the one on bottom, scrambles very well. His scrambles are very solid. I really saw, liked what I saw. And if for some reason he's the one getting taken down here, I don't expect him to get held down. I think either he'll hit a sub or he'll sweep and get back up. So because of that, I have to lean Bogdan Grad here. I think that he's the cleaner striker. I think he's the better grappler. I think Tom no Nolan has a hole in the grappling. And while I think there's a lot of future upside in Tom Nolan, I think this is a really hard matchup for him. So I went with Bogdan Grad. I played him at plus 120. I actually did it today, I'm pretty sure. And the line's already down to plus 100. I did not move that line. <laughs> I do not move lines, not yet. But I would get, if you're watching this and you agree with my breakdown or you afterwards you looked at it yourself, I would hop on soon because I do expect this line to flip. Grad is just, he's built like a, like, I don't even know how to explain it. The dude is ripped, absolutely ripped. Check check out his Instagram. I just feel like he's going to be the more physical guy, even though he's a shorter man. My only concern is how is he going to deal with this height, disadvantage, this reach, disadvantage, and maybe the power of Nolan. But overall, I think he's going to be okay. I think he can stay safe. He does keep his guard up high. And I think eventually he's going to knock out Nolan maybe on the ground, ground and pound, something like that. I think he will get the finish, but I'm not going to wait for props. I don't need those. He's the underdog. I'm more than happy to just put a unit on it, on him. And that's exactly what I did. So Bogdan Grad is the pick for me. I like him quite a bit in this matchup. I'm a little nervous because I really do respect Tom Nolan as a, as a prospect, but right now I, I think it's Bogdan Grad's time. And we're going to move on to our last fight of the evening. This one's super interesting, and I'll explain why. We've got Cesar Almeida versus Lucas Fernando Almeida. He's 3-0. He's undefeated as a pro, 35 years old. He's 6 feet tall. And let me double-check the camp. I've got him at Extreme Couture now. Fernando on the other side, he's 9-1-0. Oh. He's 6'3". He's going to be 3 inches taller. 
He's definitely younger than 35. I don't have his age on me. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, no, no, I don't. But, and he trains out of refit pro fighters. But let, let's talk about Caesar first. This is the guy that there's been some hype about because he's fought Alex Pereira in kickboxing and he fought him three times. All three went to decision and he actually beat Alex one of those times. He beat Pereira, then he lost to Pereira twice. So I see why the UFC is sticking him in here. They want him to build up another narrative, right? If he can get a nasty knockout and he can get in there and he can start working his way up, we've got another story here. We've got another uh, narrative to talk about. We have another thing that the UFC could push. I just, I don't know. I think this is a rough fight for him. So he in kickboxing, he's 47, eight and one. That's a pretty good record. He fought in glory, pretty solid. I watched some of his kickboxing matches. I actually really like it. I found it interesting that in his MMA fights, maybe it's because they don't last as long. He's not really throwing kicks. He's mostly just using his hands, which are pretty nasty his hands are very good he's fast crisp boxing goes really well to the body but the only thing i'll note is he's a little bit loopier he doesn't really throw straight strikes all that much he likes to put a little bit of a curve to it but he's got good power mixes it up really well and those body shots are great and if he's using those kickboxing kicks that he ha had his, in his arsenal i think that's also going to be really helpful he's got good leg kicks and he's got a really nice front kick the problem is and there's a few problems, right? The, the defensive grappling, similar problem with Alex Pereira, similar problem with Izzy coming into the UFC was that lack of takedown defense because of their kickboxing background. I have to imagine that he's working on it at Extreme Couture because why would you continue working on your striking instead of catching up your wrestling to your high level of striking? But I can't assume things, right? I can't just assume that he has good takedown defense. I've never seen it tested. And the other problem is that he's only got three MMA fights, right? And the last one was in 2021. Hasn't really fought anyone good. Uh, one of them was 5-28-1. and one. That was his record. The other one was 0-0-0 o, o, o at the time. But now he's 4-1-0, so decent, I guess. And then the other one was 0-0-0 and never fought again. So very little cage time for him. None of those went past one round. I think two of them barely passed a minute. So... He hasn't spent a lot of time in the MMA cage. Now you look at a guy in Lucas Fernando and, you know, I, I like a lot that I see from him. I really like his striking, great leg kicks. He uses that length very well. He knows how to use it. Nice combinations. He'll mix in the hands, the kicks, go to the body, go back to the legs, back to the head. Very clean. Five knockout wins of his own. My one concern, he's got a bit of a tall man's defense. He could definitely get chin checked here. That's definitely a possibility that could happen. But I think that if he's smart, he'll grapple. Because why? Why would you stand with this guy? Why would you stand with somebody who you know has a kickboxing win over Alex Pereira? Why would you stand with somebody who you know has a 47-8-1 kickboxing record? It's probably not the move. I imagine that he will stand with him to an extent. But I do think at some point he's going to wrestle. It's not like that's his thing. He doesn't normally wrestle often. He's only got two submission wins, and the last one was in 2018. But I really truly think that if he wants to win this fight and not have to worry about going to sleep, he's going to need to grapple. And I, th I do think he will. I'm not playing him at this price tag of minus 265 because I don't know that he's going to grapple, and I don't want to lay that kind of chalk here against the guy in Cesar Almeida who, while has, he has very little MMA experience, he probably does have the better striking here, and he's clearly a threat on the feet. But I, I do think that Fernando's the right side here. The, you know what this kind of reminds me of? I forget the guy's name, but they brought someone in last season against Eric Silva, a grappler. And the guy they brought in was a guy, who, Boinazarian, I think was his name. He had a kickboxing win over Giga Shikadze. So I already saw what they were trying to line up there, and it didn't work out for them. He, he got dominated. It was a stupid matchup to make. It made no sense. Why would you give a guy with a clear kickboxing background and no grappling experience, a guy who's a very good grappler? It, it didn't make any sense, and the result <laughs> showed that. So, look, it's really going to come down to the game plan of Fernando. If he grapples, I think this is going to look easy, and I think he'll probably get a submission. If he strikes, it could still look decently like favorable to him, but... I don't think it's a good idea. I think Almeida's probably the better striker. 
just based off of his credentials. But we'll have to see how it goes in MMA for him against guys who are actually good and not the bums that he's been facing in 2021 and prior. The way I'm looking at this right now, unless the odds like really go crazy the other way, I see money coming in on Cesar Almeida. Unless it continues to do so, I don't think I'll be playing any money line here or definitely not parlaying Fernando by any means. But I will look. I will look at at the sub prop for Fernando. If they give me anything around plus two, three, four hundred, I'm in. I'll definitely play that. Test out that gr- grappling game of Almeida, and I'll look for the unders because obviously unders are going to make a lot of sense here. When you have one guy who has a grappling edge and could get a sub if he's smart, and you have another guy who clearly has really good striking and great knockout power, so I'll be looking for that under. I have a feeling it's not going to be playable, but. In terms of a pick, I'm going to pick Lucas Fernando because he's a more experienced mixed martial artist. He's more well-rounded. And again, the grappling, I think, is going to be a vital weapon against a guy like Cesar Almeida. But I also don't want to stand in front of Almeida here. I don't want to throw three units onto Fernando to win just over one. It's not for me. So Fernando's the pick, but I, I would stay off of it unless the line really changes or unless you're willing to trust Almeida without knowing his takedown defense because he's plus 205. If you think that Fernando's not going to shoot and you're not that concerned about the takedown defense of Almeida, you might have a clear clear underdog here to take. For me personally, it's not the move, so I'll be staying off. But Fernando, once again, is the pick. And that's it, guys. That's it. That's five car- the five fights. That's Dana White's Contender Series Week 1 for 2023. I'll run through it one more time with my picks and who I'll be betting. And then we're going to get out of here. We went just over that 25-minute mark I wanted to do. So for the first fight, Kevin Borjas versus Victor Diaz. I'm picking Victor Diaz. No bet yet, but I'll be looking out for the submission props. Peyton Talbot versus Reyes Cortez. I'm picking Cortez. And I'll be playing him money line. Just watching that line first. Kyle Machado versus Kevin Soflarski. I'll pick Soflarski. Probably not touching it with a 10-foot pole. I don't want to put my hard-earned money on that one. Tom Nolan versus Bogdan Grad already have Grad at plus 120, and I think plus 100 is still a good spot. And then Cesar Almeida, Fernando, I'll pick Fernando, but it's a complete and utter pass. I'll look out for that sub prop, and that's it. Thank you guys for watching. Appreciate you guys big time. Make sure to follow me on Twitter. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Like this video. Appreciate you guys. Peace out. And-